what's the biggest number one reason and maybe someone does fail with Tim's buying from your perspective? I think it's often, and it sounds bad, but people will often ring me and say, I'm going to buy a gym's round. I've been stuck in an office. Just want to get fit and healthy and buy a gym's round. If you're going to go and buy a business because you feel a bit unfit and you're putting on weight, maybe you just don't have the right motivation and, and therefore buying the gyms won't work for you. And I've had it happen, yeah. but they just, they're lazy. But if you're lazy or you're not motivated, you're going to struggle. And sometimes in that interview process, people will be really good at saying how motivated they are, how, yeah, how they're looking forward to getting up early and keep cracking into it. Thank you very much for joining me, Ben. Now, Ben Ward has been on, a couple, on our concept before. We've interviewed a lot of Ben's franchisees in the Geelong region. Now, Ben's a bit of a gym's legend. He's sort of, we don't do a hell of a lot of content online with Ben. You see him all the time, but Ben's a very big player in our mowing division. He's been around for many, many, many years. He's in Jim's book. You've been with Jim's mowing, I think, since you were 18 or 19, Ben. Was that right? That's correct, mate. 1997, it was. 18. And, yep. So you can do the math. It's 2024. So you've, you've, you've been around for a very, very long time. Oh, so, hey. and how, so how, did you want to talk real quickly, bit of, bit of a quick short summary of your story, Jim's, for people? You haven't heard about it. How did you get involved? How have you grown you during gyms and where you are today with it? Finished high school in at the end of 1996. And I think February or maybe March that following year, I started working for a gyms mowing franchisee. One of my good mates had been working with him and he needed an extra hand. So I did that. I reckon it was only for like four months. And that franchisee was putting his round on the market and being ignorant, I suppose. I had no idea what I was doing, but I just said to my parents, I want to buy this guy's business. Originally, Theo Benny was the franchisor. He said that I was too young and he wouldn't sell it to me. And then my old man, who had just recently retired from the police force, and he'd actually worked with Theo's brother, he came in and met with Theo and said, listen, if he stuffs it up, I'll take it over. But I'm confident that he'll, he won't make a mess of it. And eventually, Theo let me start. So I reckon that was August... 1997. It's still funny. I always remember in primary school, so maybe when I was 10 or 11, I remember a Jim's mowing trailer pulled up out the front of the school. And I reckon there was ads on TV at that time. And I remember having to talk to the Jim's mowing guy. Like, not a, I would have been a little smart aleck, but I was just saying, how's Jim's or good stuff, Jim's or whatever. And he came over and had a chat. And then, yeah, 10 years later or whatever, I'm jumped into a franchise, but he would have been one of the first people to have a franchise in Geelong, that guy, I reckon. It's amazing because you've been there for nearly 30 years now and you've come, you, know, you used to run the training program as well. So the training program in gyms has developed over the years and you're heavily involved in the success of that. And to where you are now, you're pretty, I think you're the most populated franchisor in terms of households per franchisee in Australia as well, which is quite impressive because it means you've got a lot of happy franchisees and people are talking about coming into your region and joining it and what they can do. So do you want to talk about first your region itself at the moment currently? How many franchisees are in your region? Yeah, so 92. I actually, to backtrack a little bit, in 1997 I bought the franchise. In 2003, Theo offered me half of his region and I ended up, finance was challenged, I ended up bringing another guy in who I'd done a fair bit of work with. So the two of us ran 25 franchisees it was back then, so 2003. And then after 12 months, I bought that guy out. He wasn't enjoying it and he was looking to retire so i think i started with 25 potentially got that up to say 50 rough numbers and then well i have to be five or six years ago i bought the southern part of geelong which included the surf coast and the bellarine and we've got that up to 92 franchisees yeah mostly really happy franchisees good blokes i've said it and i say it all the time if you bring good people in one, it's enjoyable working with them. But two, the customers have a better experience. So we've got a, a, a good good team down here and we all, yeah, it's not unusual to have three different gyms mowing a lawn in the same street, but we all get along and high five and say good day and um, work as a team. So it's it's good. Yeah, because I interviewed one of your guys last week, the week before Steve the Spearman, and he's been around for oh, 10, good. Years, 10, 10 years. I think he went to see you from school or something. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, Must be quite amazing having someone from school all of a sudden come. It's a pretty... Pretty bad, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. I've had had a fair bit of it, actually. Yeah, Stephen was really good mates with my brother through high school. And then, yeah, the next thing he's a, a franchisee. And often I don't know until they've already signed or they've turned up at the training course or whatever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't remember you. So, yeah, <laughs> and that's that's an advantage of doing business where you grew up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Geelong, you know, it's a big place. It's still, you know, you, it's a, you know you've got the regional town vibe where most people will know someone or indirectly they'll know someone who knows that person. So... It's sort of a good good family vibe in your region. 
No, you can't mess up. Put it that way because someone will <laughs> someone will point it out pretty quickly, mate. Oh, no. So how's the business? Because you you wore a franchise at 24. Were you? It was a 24, 25. Was yeah, so pretty young. I was 24, I think. So even in the training at that time, there was a whole session um, dedicated to selecting the right franchisees. And there was like five key points that I was do not sell to anyone under 25. Um, and I remember sitting in the room going, well, this is a bit, um, doesn't quite add up. Yeah. But I guess in hindsight, it probably was unusual to one, be a franchisee at 18, and then two, to be uh, the franchise or take on the franchise or role. And it was Theo. Theo didn't offer the business to anyone else. He just wanted me to get it. And he helped, not all of it, half of it, but he helped me with the finance and getting it all through and stuff. So he was just, I think he was pleased that I did the right thing for him, uh, by him. And then even when I was a franchisee, and I think it's important for all people, you just don't know when things might turn come back in 20 years later, five years later, but I looked after Theo a lot. If someone was injured or, or sick, Theo would ring me and I'd go and do whatever he, whatever it is that he wanted and I had access to friends that could help me. So, yeah, the Lawn franchise, the guy got sick. I went down there and looked after it for three months, just just doing things to help Theo. But in the end, Theo helped me by getting the business to me. Absolutely. Now, don't explain to people regional franchise or they might not be knowing what it is. Um, do you explain to people outside, Jim, what is a regional franchisor and what is your role um, with Jim Smiling? I struggle sometimes trying to explain it to people at parties and whatever. <laughs> I guess the, to, to simplify it, it is I bring new people into the business, I help existing franchisees get out of the business, and then in between all of that is on their first um, port of call if they have a problem or an issue, and then I support them throughout their Jim's journey, I suppose, is what you guys often talk about and just help um, facilitate network, bring guys together. So really, it's just a it's a support role and people always, occasionally people call me their boss and I'm like, no, you're my boss. You tell me what to do and I'll I'll try and fix it. So, you know, yeah, in a small explanation of a sort of a fairly unusual role, it's basically just supporting people that are in the business. It's pretty amazing what you do because you've got a lot of franchisees, which can be quite time consuming but the um in regards to what you have to do so many different things new sales selling customers all that sort of stuff and complaints and different things that come up and how do you manage it all from a time perspective is it just you've had so many years of experience you know where to put your your time and energy or how does it sort of work from your end yeah it's and my franchisees and i'm the first to admit it i, I fall behind i can miss text messages or emails or whatever um i've spent the last 12 months bringing automation into the region so just trying to help with, you know, bookkeeping programs and, and outsourcing stuff. So I think I used to do too much of it, whereas now I'm starting to outsource to try and make sure that I can focus on the most important part, and that is to make sure the franchisees are happy and making money. So- I, will, I will say this, though. I've interviewed a few of your franchisees recently, and they all give you a massive rap. I haven't actually heard someone say you don't not get back to anything. You're always there on the phone. So the franchisees who I've interviewed of yours say you do a fantastic job from that point of view. Yeah, I, when I say I fall behind, sometimes just I think in customer service things have got to happen quickly, yeah. um, and that's the same at any level. But yeah, you know, I don't like it when I get to a Friday afternoon and and I haven't responded to an email that was sent to me on Wednesday. So that can wear me down a little bit. But I think it's just about having structure. And again, if you've got to focus on doing the right things by people, generally they'll give you a bit of leeway as well. If you if you do fall behind, and I'm, I'm- employ employ people in the last few years to to help keep me on track now i was going to say if someone's looking at a jim's mind franchise what are some things to know what are some misconceptions that you commonly address so people some misconceptions about being a franchisee that you come across you would have heard it all in your years about prospects yep. so what are some misconceptions you want to maybe clear up for people and what are some things uh, that people ask about the business that you you can let them know so obviously the big one that everyone will talk about is that restricted in where they can work so very quickly, I try and point out that your territory doesn't mean a great deal. Yes, it's handy and it's there is some importance to selecting the right territory. And that only the only criteria I have on that is to make sure it's as close to your house as possible. So you can work anywhere. I say to guys, you can work in Werribee or you can work in Apollo Bay or you can stick in Geelong. Like it is completely up to you where you nominate. Um, and then we help them choose what services they receive in particular suburbs. So I always say like a rubbish, every franchisee should have the suburb that the tip is at and just have that for rubbish removal jobs only. So if you ever get a lead, you're only five minutes from the tip and put that suburb in so you get that work. So little things like 
like that that uh, are hard until you actually get in the business but then i think people are surprised by how well the franchisees get along with each other um so they're often expecting it to be um competitive which yep. it's not the franchise expiring so when does it expire um and it doesn't really their contracts get renewed after 10 years and often that's renewed in their favor so they they, they would get um cheaper fee structure than someone that's uh, just point. joining yeah and then everyone's just got sort of little different things and often it's that uh it's the neighbor or their best friend or their wife or their uncle that's giving them misinformation about gyms and that can be yeah it can be hard to sort of win them over and and get them to trust what you're what you're saying yeah. and i'm saying yeah it's where's the catch and there isn't really a catch other than they've just got to be prepared to work hard it's a great point. We get tarred with the same brush with franchising, unfortunately, when there's a bad baker's delight or some other site-based franchise, which, you know, 40% of turnover and there's unscrupulous landlords and they just tar franchising with the same brush, which is why we do this content. And these type yeah. of things is to try and address that misconception that we take 30% of your turnover and all that yes. sort of stuff. We've just got to keep hanging at home. It's not the case. <laughs> yeah, so the um, the franchise fees is, is another one. That, and people don't necessarily have... A misunderstanding of it they just don't quite get it the percentage of turnover and stuff occasionally pops up with probably thanks to the um the content online we've probably addressed that so the franchise fees the set set amount if we can run through that and try and explain to them how it works and then they can see and understand that well if they're running their business well enough that that franchise fee is incidental because it the brand will offer them great opportunity to be able to um to build a good run and and if you're making money, that two hundred dollars a week or not even depends. Everyone's different, but and that's around how many leads they're taking or whatever. But if you're making a dollar, that those lead fees are minuscule compared to uh, what they can be doing if they run the business well. Yeah, you don't have to worry about Google Ads. You don't have to worry about website. You don't have to worry about all that stress of generating online work. They just yeah. they're concentrating on doing a good job. And I think people forget how hard it is now. I see it a lot of the time in the finance groups and Reddit and stuff and people go, what about a gym's franchise? And we've done a few things with gym responses and some Reddit things and some of the incorrect yeah, information. Yeah, say them. yeah, and the ones that always come up is, you know, just uh, you don't need gyms. Put that money into getting a few flies and dropping around your neighborhood. Next thing you know, you'll be a, a successful business owner compared to, you know, you don't need gyms. You can do it yourself, that sort of thing. Maybe what would you say to that? Then someone maybe looking at, I don't need the franchise. I can do it myself. What would you say to them? Maybe just to some realistic considerations they maybe should think about before doing that maybe in the last five years i've had more independence cross over to gyms which is a good thing i think if you're really good and you've got a good i guess marketing strategy and you can build up your client base and do it on your own there's definitely advantages to that what i think the biggest thing that gyms offers our guys is to really reduce their travel and receive leads where they want them if you've got an ad online you might get a, a lead in the morning from lara which is 20 minutes from geelong and the next lead could be Talk E, which is 20 minutes the other way from Geelong. So you've got through one advertising campaign, you're getting all these clients spread too far. Whereas our system allows us just to eliminate what areas and what suburbs we want to work in, and you can really cluster up. And then I think it is that networking that, that having other franchisees to bounce off. And yes, there's Facebook pages and groups online for, for independence. Um, and a lot of the main guys and franchisees are in that as well. It's just that stuff's not. You can't trust that the information on there is as reliable as what it will be if it's coming from a local franchise or in your area who's putting you in touch with local franchisees that have been doing it for 15 years. So I think that networking helps. And often forgotten in all of this is that the way that Jim's structured up the contracts and stuff, it's quite easy for them to sell their business when they want to get out. So there's, you know, it's really is a low risk business because if I put someone on tomorrow, they spend 25,000 on the franchise. If they were to walk away, in theory, we should be able to sell their franchise for a similar amount to what they bought it for. And so really it's only the equipment costs is hard to get back if it was to fail. And yeah. it failed anyway. Yeah, and that's yeah, that's exactly really good point. And I great point I heard from a franchisee talking about his perspective as a franchisor. You get you you know ninety two individual businesses at the moment. So you know different things from every from all these different businesses and they can come to you anytime and you've got access to you who has all this knowledge and from every single situation you've seen over these years. In regards to your, the franchise or value as well, you get this, you, you refer to it as like mentorship, but like, yeah, we call them franchisors, but you're essentially a business coach who gets access to every scenario in um, yep. MG. So um, I think that's a good point as well, what you said. And and um, well, then let, let's talk about the failure. So why do you think in gyms, we'll try and be honest about this sort of stuff. What's what's the biggest number one reason that maybe someone does fail with gyms buying from your perspective? What are, what are some things that people should be aware of? 
I'm sort of the, the, the easy ones are a young kid buys a franchise, perhaps loses his license for drink driving or something like that, and then he's trying to pay people to drive him around. So like you have a few of those bad luck stories, I guess, or um, not necessarily bad luck, you make your own, but then you have potentially the odd one where injuries might, you know, an old footy injury might flare up or something and they, they struggle with it. But normally you can, it is a healthy sort of a occupation. So I've maybe had one in the 20 years or 25 years or whatever that injuries have got the better of. But I think it's often, and it sounds bad, but people will often ring me and say, I'm going to buy a gym's round. I've been stuck in an office. You know, I just want to get fit and healthy and buy a gym's round. If you're going to go and buy a business because you feel a bit unfit and you're putting on weight, maybe you just don't have the right motivation and, and therefore buying the gyms won't work for you. And I've had it happen. Yeah. But they just, they're lazy. And I can say that because I'm overweight myself. So yeah. um, <clears throat> I'm lazy. I need to walk the dog today, but I might not get to it. But if you're lazy or you're not motivated, you're going to struggle. And sometimes in that interview process, people will be really good at saying how motivated they are, how yeah, you know, how they're looking forward to getting up early and keep cracking into it. Well, when they start saying stuff like that to me, I start to worry that they try to use gyms or their uh, to force. franchise, yeah, to force them to get fit, which is probably not going to happen. They probably, probably do a trial day or spend a week at least with a franchisee before making any decision. Yeah, and I try and get them out with a franchisee that works in a in a suburb with lots of hills, just to <laughs> really just test. test. Yeah, um, so I think those ones, and then you have like. Usually there's an outside influence, so relationship breakdowns. Yeah, um, normally you can if you delve into it far enough, and I don't necessarily do that. Like I'm, I'll, I'll just try and help people with whatever they ask me. So if they want to get out, I'll help them get out. But yeah, I think like so personal issues, and then potentially guys that just necessarily financially savvy, and I wasn't, but I had no commitment, so I was young and mm. young and dumb, and could just sort of make bad choices and whatever, but I could get away with it because I didn't have a family dependent on me. Um, but if you're not careful with your money and you're not perhaps working as hard as what you could be, you, the pressure can come from your wife or your parents or your family. So you just, that they're the ones that probably come to mind with people sort of struggling with the franchise. The main thing, yeah, the main thing for people to take out of it, you've got to work hard in Jim's mind. It's not just a foolproof thing for success. I know we do a lot of content online and, People can hear all the success stories and think it just happens, but there's a lot of hard work that goes into yeah. those success stories from people. Yeah, and um, maybe in a rush. So sometimes guys will be trying to get there too quickly and I just slow them down. Any business takes five years to to establish. Luckily for us, with the franchise model, it might be two to three years before they can yep. really say that they're comfortable and they're across it all. So they've got to be prepared to, to have that first year or first three months of challenges. And I always say, if there's something keeping you up at night or there's something that's stressing you out, you need to let me know because usually we can we can step that stress pretty quick. Yeah, I remember mean, interviewed one of you guys last week, Steve, and, and he was saying I mean, another good thing we should mention for people, he's had an injury at the start of spring. He'd done a tendon in his hand. I yeah. think it was out for three months and he had four franchisees, Mark Logan, and there was a few other ones who covered his round at the start of spring and kept his business going. And he's saying without that, like if he was not with Jim's mowing, he would not have been able to survive at all. So I thought that was a really good, uh, thing people to know as well like if, you, if you're an independent you do not have that cover you might have a mate or something and that's fair enough but i think it's a really underestimated point like if you want to do holidays or there is an injury you can have coverage from the franchisees in the region as well to keep your business alive because he said if he didn't have that his business would have been he would have been stuck yeah yeah that was an unlucky one that that injury um and again you're 100 correct and even on top of that that one three one five four six so occasionally a franchisee will tell clients that he hasn't got time to fit them in anymore. And then we'll get a, a flurry of calls to our call center and they say, oh, the previous guy hasn't got time or whatever. And it goes out to another um, franchisee. So if they can't get onto a franchisee, they can get back to the call center and at least we can try and, um, yeah, make sure that they don't lose that customer or, yeah, direct them back to the franchisee or um, we start to get a bit of an insight. So that the 131 number or a call center is handy. The network and using that at work. And then when things do happen, holidays, injuries, whatever, very easy to get, get it covered. Now, in your businesses as well, you you have some guys who just do some specialist stuff. Like if people just want to do landscaping, they can do it. Or if they want to do gutters, they can just do that. Do you have any franchisees? Even though it's titled Jim's Mowing, but there's a lot more that franchisees can do. Do you have any franchisees who are doing those sorts of things, specialist sort of areas? Yeah, so I've got a couple of Jim's landscaping trailers and I've got a Jim's gutter cleaning that's probably eight months um, he was a mowing franchisee and just 
sold off his mowing run and bought the gutter back trailer. So he's eight months into it. It's probably been harder than he anticipated in terms of the last 12 months with the economy and people second guessing. So double story gutters are the expensive. So I think he's, there's no regrets there, but clients, uh, it's harder for him to get that sort of, you know, 350, 400 for a double story gutter than perhaps what it was two years ago. Yep. Um, but no, that, 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 that's longevity in the business for him. So that's another thing that people perhaps don't understand from the outside is that we can manipulate and change services. Like we get guys that turn 50 and I say, I don't want to climb a ladder anymore. And so any client that they have where they need, or they ask them to, to do gutters or high work, they, they'll have a list of franchisees that they just call on for those jobs, which enables the franchisee to stay in the business for another 10 years because he can just stick to the to the now services that suit him. It's a great point. Another thing we should point out to people is the, um, you can build a business with no extra charges. I think there's a misconception as well. If you want to put in extra trailers or employees, gyms will charge you extra and stuff like that. So do you want to outline maybe some guys in your region who are doing that, who have employees and staff and how that all works? You're 100% correct. So the more money you make, your fees stay the same. And whether that's five trailers, 10 trailers or, or one trailer, I'm sure Jim did it for a reason. Or was, um, was, But that's a, a really smart way that he's, he's done that because if you're a successful franchisee, as I said earlier, your fees are quite easy to cover. If you're not a good franchisee and you're not providing good service and you're not converting on your quotes, well, those fees will sound high because you're not you're not making enough. So something's got to change. Normally, we can get 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 them to change and improve, and then the fees become insignificant again. And what's the biggest business in your region from your buyers? Is there a guy like with five trailers or four trailers or a couple of vehicles, or what's the biggest one in the region? I reckon two trailers, three trailers, and maybe three or four employees. We actually did a, uh, a survey of the franchisees last year. It was an anonymous survey where they come back to us with their turnover for the year. And I was uh, pleasantly surprised, but the I think the highest for our region was 330000 But we have had guys doing a lot more than that in the past. But for whatever reason, they scaled back maybe through COVID and, mm. and all that. But I don't, off the top of my head, I don't think there's anyone that's got three trailers on the go at the moment. Um, whereas Melbourne, that's a little bit more common. I was going to say, to interview well, Mark Logan. Um, I reckon he's up to two trailers, but maybe three employees. Jim caught up with him at the trade day and um, okay. yeah, he asked him a few questions, but I, I don't think we got that out of him as well. No. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but there you go. But yeah, the, it's a good option for people. They want to build a business, they can. And they're encouraged to do it as well via the system. There's no extra fees or anything. As you said, the more you earn revenue wise, your fees is a real small uh, proportion. That's all of the percentage. Correct. Absolutely. And I was going to say as well, Ben. Um, when someone buys a business with you, what do they normally get? So they go, right, ready to go, franchise fee. Do you want to just walk them through the process? What's involved yep. with it all to getting from, let's say, I like this idea of it to actually starting in the field? What's in between? Yep. So a general normal process, I guess you would say, they meet with me. I show them as much as I can in the computer as to how they allocate work and how many leads they can expect and you know, what rounds are available. Then I try and get them out on the road for a trial day to go and see what the guys do each on a day-to-day basis. Then they will choose, well, they'll get to the point where they're comfortable to buy the franchise. At this point, they still haven't committed to any money or any of um, handed over any cash or deposits. And then we would try and lock down on a business or book them into training. And so once they're booked into training, then we can start to, to map out a timeline for them where they, we can sort of say, right, well, as long as we've got this, this, and this done, you should be right to start on your own by that 1st of March. And then... I actually do it a little bit differently to other people in that I try and get the franchisees to build their network um, with the local suppliers down here. So I don't steer them in direction of any equipment or mm-hmm. or package up anything. We give them a safety pack when they start, which is uh, $795 for all of the safety gear that they need to be compliant. Um, but the rest of it, I try and steer them off to go and meet with the different mower shops, build their network. And I think that's important because if you're, if you're in business and you buy your mower from the local guy, if something goes wrong with it, that local shop should look after you and try and do their best by you. So I think that's important. And even things like tip fees and that I try not to get involved with because I want the guys to build their own their own network and, and yeah, working with other businesses. So then it's just uniforms, business cards, yeah, ad hoc stuff. Get them through the training course and then, yeah, we... we usually get them to spend as much time as they can with the guy they're buying the franchise off is in the existing franchisee and then they're they're right to go 
What about the fears around the equipment training? So I've spoken to a few people. I always speak to people who come through training and a lot of their fears generally seems to be the, the reverse. Like they always fear about, can I do the edge properly or can I mow the lawn properly? They never, it's never the customer service side, whereas we know that the customer service side is probably the most important part as opposed to the actual other side of it. So how do you train, like what training do you have in place or what sort of can you say to someone if they're coming from a completely corporate environment, they might be you know, just mowing their lawn at home and then maybe not as confident doing those other things. How does it all work from your perspective with new franchisees who've come from a really low, let's say, industry knowledge base to to where they where they can go? Yeah, um, that's interesting, Joel. I've never heard it put like that, which is which is true. They they worry about their pruning or edges or whatever. But as you say, the customer service is is the key. So I always say to to people that a good person who's easy to get along with and the customers like can do an okay job and the customers will still keep him because they like him and he yeah. makes their life easier and he turns up when he says he's going to and they don't have to worry about the lawns or the garden or whatever. So, But if you're a, a little bit rough around the edges in terms of the way you interact with people and they don't necessarily, you're not someone that um, people warm to easily, if you do an okay job, you might find that more of those people will move on to somewhere else. So it's similar to what you said in terms of your customer service, but if you do a really good job, and you're a really good bloke, you're going to be flat stick. Mm. And the way you do a really good job is just to to take your time, learn from others, have you know, pride in your work, all the you know, the normal stuff that you would hear. And if you're not good at something, just go and practice it. So the biggest thing for fran- new franchisees is my edges are no good, or I'm worried about the uh, the whippersnipper. Most of the time, you've been using a residential, not a um, commercial grade. We've just never in your personal life. So as soon as you get on the end of one of the, the commercial grade or all the commercial grade equipment, it makes it makes the job a lot easier. And then it's a time thing. So go and do all your neighbors' nature strips. It takes about two weeks to get get the hang of the whipper snipper, I reckon, if you if you really crack in and have a go at it. And if you're still struggling, there's other tools now. So there's like blade edges that you know, battery power, you can they're light, easy to get around. So the first time you to a client's property, you could potentially use that. And the next time, you'll be able to deal with your Weber snipper. Unless you're in Perth, because you guys use it. Yeah, <laughs> so, that was in the and yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but they, they can learn it. It's not rocket science. It's just being committed and that eye for detail. And you know, not everyone has that, but looking back over a job, just making sure you haven't missed anything, you'll get three months and you, you should should be have it down pat. And just say to the clients, I know my edges aren't as good as... Dave, who I've bought the round off, but he was doing it for 15 years. I promise you that in three months' time, I'm going to be doing as good as his, or if not better. Yeah, it's the only reason why I say because I meet a few franchisees in training. A lot of them are from sales rep or BDM backgrounds, and you meet them, they're really nice people. And they say, I'm a bit concerned that in the mowing component, because the mowing training we have at National as well, there's not much hands on stuff. It's generally listening to someone talk about it, and they get a bit scared, but it's sort of the other way around. Whereas if you can do the sales and you're a BDM, you've probably got 95% of the actuals stuff that really matters and then the other step is obviously doing a good job but that will come as you go and then you have all the experience where they can go to you or the franchisees in the area come across this thing or how do i tackle this and i'll get a response pretty quick as well yeah and um yeah even with the training course so i think you touched on it earlier it was 2007 where i actually had back surgery had to let go of my franchise because um i had some some bad uh nerve damage and then I got the role as the national training manager, but we did. We had a fair bit of hands-on equipment training, and it was just there was no good. There was no benefit <laughs> from it. And I, I'll argue till the day I die that you can't in in a training course in Melbourne. You cannot expect that people jump on a whippersnapper and learn how to do it. And we're mostly male dominated, but we're all too cool. Sit back, half of them having a cigarette, no way knowing they're going to go on try and do an edge in front of 30 people that have only met four days away, uh, four days ago. Yeah. Um, so it just didn't work. And a lot of people say, oh, there should be more hands-on. But yeah. if anyone ever gives you grief over it, Joel, give them my number because <laughs> I know we tried and we tried and it was just never going to work. Yeah, we get it a bit and I try and tell them that from experience. But um, yeah, if you want to see the training, anyone can go type in Kim's training. You'll see everything online. We actually have full sessions from back in the day. There's a couple from you back in the day when you used to do it. Yeah. still. I do miss the training. It was um, great. <laughs> Great fun seeing all the new guys. And once my kids are a bit older, I'm just in that little window now where my kids are uh, 10 and 12 and after school sports. And it's about a two hour drive from Geelong to get up to. Do you come back and do this? I would, yeah, once they're older. It's just that oh, in the end, I was calling on the uh, uh, babysitters and all that too much. My wife works in Melbourne as well. So in the end, I just had to say, oh, 
I'm going to have to stop doing it. But I did love it. And it, yeah, it's good fun, meet some good people. Yeah, it's a good, it's a really good training experience. So that for those that don't know, you do the three day generic and then you do the three days, you do your Thursday, Friday, and the Saturday, sort of morning to two o'clock. Um, with, with experienced people up there, I think it's um, John Wilds and um, I think it's a Matt. Uh, there's there's is doing the um yeah, stuff right. yeah yeah so you, it's done. yeah so you've got really experienced guys and um and doing it so it's a really good really good program for it but we get that question a bit am I going to learn how to use a mower or an edge there why don't you teach that so it's sort of good to hear from your perspective that you've actually tried it before and and seen it so yeah, it can be quite difficult and if you are a new franchisee and you're listening to this or you're going to be a new franchisee honestly if you're worried about mowing and your yeah, technique and all that. Just let your franchise all know and the day that you've got four hours spare or five hours spare or a whole day spare, find out from your franchise all who you can go and jump in the car with and go and help him mow a few lawns. Obviously, you get a chin wag in between. You're going to be um, making him get through his work a bit quicker and you will learn really, really quickly. What you do with someone in four hours back at home in the field would take five days at head office. So... Just and reach out to people. That's the beauty of gyms, which Joel touched on before. But I've got a guy, and I found out this just by coincidence, but a franchisee bumped into a gym who's been with us for 14 years. And he said, Oh, I know how many lawns you've done today. He said, I've done 12 or 14. He's like, There is no way known you can do 14. I've only been able to do seven. And so now they're going to go and jump in the car together, know a few of each other's lawns. And this franchisee is going to, yeah, he'll turn his business from 350 a day to 550 a day just on the back of a subtle conversation at the tip or at the milk bar or whatever. And that's, yeah, you can drive it and you can, there's enough of a network out there for you to make a real go of it. You said it before, I think it's a really big point is that the cop, people think I'm competing with other franchisees. That's, that's an outsider's perspective sometimes. And as you said, it's complete opposite. It's, it's the other way around. They, they help each other. I've never heard of any rivalries or competition from my end anyway, I bet, between franchisees ever. Yeah, it's a friend, friendly rivalry, like I'm earning more than you or I'm yeah. smashing out 16 and you're only doing 15 mows, whatever it is. There's that type of rivalry and that's fun. But, um, yeah, they, uh, the boys, and I've got a female franchise there as well and she's fantastic and some female staff. So, But, they, um, yeah, the bit of banter and all that stuff helps you get through a day, but we're not competing because there's just too much work. So no one's worrying about you know, where their next dollar is coming from and so, therefore, they're not, you know, worried about the new guy starting up or look I'm sure in certain areas or at certain times there might be a few franchisees that get a little bit worried about it but like it's a very small percentage and they do they 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 are happy to see someone come along and they're happy to help them because they've all been in that position but now do you want to talk about the do you want to talk about now the income guarantee to people because that's an important thing it's obviously advertised a lot with a lot of different franchises in general saying income guarantee do you want to talk about how that works and actually the reality of how much have you actually paid over the years in regards to the income guarantee? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to say I paid out less than $1,000 in 20 years. Amazing. And, and I think it's important that people understand is that doesn't mean that everyone has met their income guarantee every every week. It's based out over four weeks. Really lucky down here in Geelong that we've got a large aged care client base. With the City of Greater Geelong, we've been doing aged care work for them for 25 years. So there is a lot of work coming through that we can give out to the guys to make sure that they're, they're kept busy. But basically, if they're quiet, they come to us and let us know. And usually they'll be like, what do I need to do for the pay for work guarantee? And we'll say, thanks for letting, letting us know. Here's what you need to do. But in the meantime, here's $3,000 worth of work that you can go and do for us straight away. And that's just through having those those contacts. Jim said it all along, and even when I first started, they, they, there was a really high conversion from franchisees that did go and do free most for people that ended up converting them into regulars. And I feel like I've got a guy that still does one a month. I think he does a free mode for someone once a month just for the, he's a good person and he, um, like sort of community minded. But yeah, I think he does still generate a little bit of work out of doing that. And that's not his intention for doing it, but he does, he does, yeah, one a month, I reckon it is. And from with the businesses as well, is there any good stories that come to mind of some recent people or over the years? What's some been some good franchisee stories? Maybe a bloke, maybe a bit down on his luck's come in and this was his last sort of go and he's made a really good life for himself. Or what was some stories over the years from, from your region? There'd be a lot. I've got a young fellow, John O'Casey, yeah, local sportsman, cricket, football, all of that. He inquired, and I reckon it's 10 years between his first inquiry and his inquiry that he ended up buying. He had a good job and, um, yeah, 
uh, corporate. So he ended up bringing a mate of his to do it with him. So the two of them, they've got two trailers. They're probably actually, their figures wouldn't have been in that survey, but they've got two trailers going and a um, couple of employees and absolutely loves it. Like should have done it 10 years earlier, all that sort of stuff. And now he's bringing in some of his mates. So they've had Andrew Hodgson's and you guys just started. Um, he's one of Jono's mates. Uh, and everywhere I turn, I seem to hear from people, oh, Jono must be under you or whatever. And I'm like, yep, good work, good operator, all that. He's been a ripper. Recently, I had a guy, same thing. I reckon it took him three years to make the jump. He might have started during COVID, inquired, uh, inquired nervous about money. Yeah, you know, good job up in Melbourne. Went to book in for training. No, completed training. And then his boss, I'll put him 40 grand pay rise or something like that. So he didn't go ahead. Nah. And then four months ago, he popped up again, said, I'm ready to go, maybe five months. And he's been going now since, I'll say, December. But he's just a random call from the call centers, um, been a, an aged care booper place, which he's picked up, which is a day a week, I think, on good money. And he's earning way more than what we forecast and what I um, told him that he could earn. And happy as Larry. And that's that's very common because I see it all the time, but I love those stories. That's mm. that's what gets me out of bed. And often I, I'm a little bit blase because I've done it for so long. I don't realize how big a jump it is for people, but I'm, I'm confident if you get, get the right people, the, the luck follows them. But to get a lead from the office, a $15 lead, it's probably a $40,000 job across the year, and it'll probably lead to another one that will lead mm. to another one. So those types of things are... Yeah, amazing, but there's heaps, heaps of them. What do you think stops people? Because um, we're here all the time. Should have done it years ago. I interview a lot of people six months, three years down the track, and they go, I should have done it years ago. They all say the same thing. If really, you just think it's a sales pitch, but it's not. They can ask the other franchisees in the areas. But um, what do you think stops people? Do you think it's people who don't know anything about gyms who just tarnish franchises all the same? Is it they don't, as you said, it's what's the catch, this sort of thing, or they like the confidence or the self-belief? What do you, you think is the biggest stopper of people from actually taking that leap you know they want to do it but they stop in the past i had trouble with accountants like i'm talking 15 years ago yes. accounts used to just say don't do it and now yeah i haven't had that happen for ages where they've come back and said my accountants told me not to do it a great point um, that's changed a bit in recent years and i agree with you i used to hear that all the time and that's changed a lot now and now i hear the other way saying people do still go to an account but they say oh it's a gym's franchise they're good so which is um yeah but you're right accountants was a big issue oh it used to Sometimes I used to want to ring him and just say, hey, look, you're talking about a guy who's on minimum income driving a forklift and you're telling him that gyms is a bad idea. Like, I just, let's Delusion. come and yeah. meet. Yeah, come and meet with me. I'll show you all the guys that are making money. Um, so, yeah, that used to be one. I read it's the little man on the shoulder, um, but more so it's that, that inner network, just, oh, why do you need to buy a franchise? Your kids are young. You've got a good job. Yeah. You know, when I, was, when I was your age or, yeah, like our parents – they just got one job and they did it forever. So yeah, just that comfort zone and hard to take that leap. And then just a few little, probably I guess people that are important to them in their lives might just throw a few things across that they just can't, that builds that brick wall that they can't jump. And that's why I always just try and get them out in the field with the guys, but try and get them to talk to as many people as possible. Because well, that's the important thing with the people need to know. You do get a list of franchisees, current and former, and we recommend that you call you know, as many as you can. We have, we do have people, which are great to hear. I know that some of them have called 20 people before coming to training and they've called finished and former and current ones as well. And that's, that's a really good thing, way to do it, to actually hear from the source as opposed to the, the third party hearsay, which is um, quite often incorrect. Yeah. So Theo, the guy I bought off and it's always stuck with me. I probably haven't used it as much as I used to, but here's a list of my franchisees. Start at the top and work your way to the bottom and you can stop once you find one person that doesn't like me or um, bags, gyms. Yeah. So his theory was that I'll get to the bottom and I'll do it. Um, but yeah, open book, we are, and all franchisors, I'm sure, are the same, but open book, do not make a financial commitment until the very, very last point, and we will give you as much information and like the content that, that your team does, Joel. Um, that's that's it filters all the way down to, to the franchisor like we are. And I've been doing it long enough. I've got 92 guys. I don't want to sell it to someone. I don't want... Someone, I don't want to be convincing you to buy a franchise. I want you to be convinced that the franchise works for you. And the only way I can do that is by giving you as much information, getting you to talk to as many people as you can. And if it's not for you, that's fine. But more often than not, 
if you enjoy the work now that I always say enjoy the work, which there's days when you, I call them barker eggs or landmines string dogs, <laughs> get them. Barker eggs. I've not heard that one before. <laughs> um, hit it with a liver snipper. That's not a good day. Don't enjoy that. And it's all over your face. Or you're walking up Shalambra Crescent, I don't know whether you, the Cadell Evans bike race, that's the Shalambra most of all lawn on that, that uh, street. And it was like literally like that. That's hard work. But, so enjoy the work to a point. You're going to have some, you know, cold, wet, rainy, hot, all that stuff. Enjoy the work and then enjoy the interaction with your customers. That's the, that's, if you, if you think you're going to enjoy those two things, and probably the last one would be if you're a bit careful with money. Now, you don't have to be careful with money. You can still be successful without it. But if you're, I'd say, tight on us and uh, enjoy the work to a point and enjoy interacting with um, customers, you will be successful. Yeah, it's a great point. You and also, as you said, su- success is something where you can do the multiple vehicles if you want. But if you want to just do the sole trade on, like Stephen does, sole trade for ten years, loves yep. the money, he's happy with it, and it works around his two sons as well. You were saying he's got shared yep. custody and stuff, and it allows him to do all those things as well. Um, it's a really, really good business. It is a. You're right. You do get the whole "what is the catch" thing just because we get franchising gets lumped in with all these other ones. But I think Jim's is a really unique model um, yeah. compared to anything else. Hundred percent, and. They're like even Steve, his or Hex father and all, he ended up buying a franchise. It's, yes, man. Yeah, sixty. Yeah, you know, like it's and very few have regrets. There, there are obviously I mean, there's the volume of people that we have come through the door. There are people that get disgruntled and uh, you know it doesn't work for them. So things that we maybe touched on earlier, but yeah, there's a, a whole lot of success stories out there. And that little man on the logo there, he's been unbelievable for me to think that I've only ever. Well, left school, started with gyms, and I've been with them ever since. And I can't see myself leaving. And that's all courtesy of him. Now he's a challenging person, as we all know, <laughs> but his 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 intentions are sound. He wants people to be, he wants franchisees to be happy. And probably so. Um, and yeah, he's been amazing for for me and my family. And yeah, even my uncle, he's like, why on earth would you want to be a law knowing man when I was eighteen? Um, he's a farmer up bush. And he often brings it up, like, but yeah, his first. So if I saw a lot of him or he was in my life a lot, I might not have made the jump because he's, he was like, why would you buy a Lawnmower franchise? That's a ridiculous stigma around it. I think there's a ridiculous stigma around home services in general. Yeah. And people, people who don't know the earning potential and the lifestyle benefits of being you know, in cleaning or mowing or dog wash or fencing or handyman, they just don't understand how you can make more money than those corporate jobs and be far happier, less stressed, don't deal with the politics and garbage and stay close to home and, and be there for your kids. It, and they just don't get they just don't get their ego out of the way to realise that. Yeah, and I think Geelong is the perfect example of that. So if you're in Geelong, it's probably changed a little bit, but if you're in Geelong and you want to earn that sort of, well, it used to be 100 grand, things are probably going up a little bit, but it's that you'd have to travel to Melbourne. So you're spending three hours commuting to Melbourne Whereas you can buy a Jim's Mowing franchise, drop the kids off to school, not miss a game of their basketball, not miss footy. You probably even end up coaching the footy team. You're making the same money without that uh, travel to Melbourne. Um, and the, I think that's why Jim's is a good option down here for, for, for people is just that location and not having a... Hit it's a great point, line. yeah. Especially in regional areas, yeah, to make that six figure, like Warnable's the same, you make that from there originally. And to make a hundred grand is a lot in Warnable. There's not many places you can work at Warnable besides being maybe a lawyer or owning a business to do that. So it's a really good opportunity. If you want to do good money in a regional area, the Jim's Mowing franchise is a good vehicle for it. 100%. I was going to say as well, Ben, how have you seen the, the brand develop over the years? You said Jim's a challenging character and those who know and can maybe see a lot of the content might work that out, but it's, I'm sure it's mentioned in an endearing way. So how, how have you seen the business develop over the years from your perspective? Because you've been for a long time, you've seen a lot of things. And do you think it's in a good position now compared to where it's been in the past? Yeah. So um, I think my first quote was $12.50 for my first lead. So wow. the um, yeah, money has changed. And I only did work for um, elderly, give or take, but not any, and maybe some real estate work and stuff. But when I first started, that first sort of stage. Uh, so now I think the public has got a greater appreciation for our industry or the home services industry. And I, I say it all the time, like it's been an interesting shift in the last five years that people have been getting their lawns made for 25 years now. Like 
it's a, a very normal thing to have someone come and get your lawns mowed. Mm. If you if they're paying seventy dollars and not enjoying that experience because they turn up late or they make a mess or whatever, people now have been through five or six different gardeners. They will pay more to have the guy that makes it really easy for them. And even things like we get complaints because they haven't sent him an in, the client hasn't been sent an invoice because they just want. I mean, part of it is the invoice them because they just want their life to be easy and they yes. just. So yeah, so I think that's changed across the industry, but and and then gyms is just a whole lot more around mm. professional outfit, like the tools and the equipment and all of that that's available to these guys now that they are making more good money and they can you know run it like a, a not a mowing round but a business. So I think that's changed. I think the perception online and all that's changed a lot, and all of that content that you guys do, and it's a big wheel. The, the clients have trust in us. And that's why we hate complaints and Jim hates complaints because on the whole, we've got a very um we've got a very good brand that the public trusts. If we all as a team continue to to deliver on that and deliver um quality service, there's no reason why this won't be going for that hundred years. That's a good point. And the brand it's a very wanky term to say the brand or brand this and you know, it's a very be a very wanky term sometimes, but it means a hell of a lot now, especially because any any Tom Dick and Harry can start a Facebook page, and all of a sudden I've got something known, and you know I'm going to take over the world, and and then they find it's really really hard to do. So to, to, to leverage off all the thousands of jobs that have gone into that goodwill and Jim's mowing in Geelong, for example, people who keep coming in at the stage now are just getting the really benefit of those decades of all those goodwill and those jobs going into the area. So when you're buying at a pretty similar price point to what you could do five years ago, you're getting some of this value. Into, with all those jobs that have gone into there and all the goodwill and all the contract work that you do, you just make an absolute no-brainer for people to start their own business. And it's a great stepping stone if they want to do other things as well. We both uh, we have a lot of people in gyms who use gyms as long as their first business and then go on to do other things as well. So it's a really great Correct. business from a lot of angles. You might stay for 30 years or you might do it for three years and stepping stone to something else. But it's just such a really good vehicle for business. And as you, you've developed yourself, you've come in here as an 18-year-old and now you're a one of the most successful franchisors in the gym's mowing division, training, all that sort of stuff. I know you've got a nice house as well. And to, to, all, to, to do with what you've been able to do with the brand. Correct. I, I did marry a solicitor as well, mate, so that helps. <laughs> but, I was going to say as well, personally, Ben, if, like, if people buy in your region, what should they know about you? I know who, you don't go for Geelong, so who do you go for? No. I'll let you say. Um, I barrack for the mighty Saners. That's why I'm so resilient. Um <laughs> I uh, gave the Saints. Um, yeah, played footy down here. Not not a very good footballer. In fact, I was horrible. Soft, softest ruckman to ever play local football. You're a big fella. Yeah, pretty t- ruckman and hard 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 desirability. Yeah, yeah. So ruckman that don't like uh, physical contact. Um, <laughs> don't generally work well together. So I was sure their footy career down here. But yeah, just uh, Belmont High School. Yeah, and like to have like to have fun don't try to take life too seriously and yeah love city of dreams mate geelong the place to be <laughs> um, and yeah just two kids and jim's passionate about it and i said he's a quirky fellow he is he's, he's he's um different and that's what's great because he sees things different to all of us and jim's has been amazing for me and i still yeah i miss the mowing people people don't believe me i'll leave you on this one joel this is one thing about mowing franchises that uh, or mowing businesses. If you're in the office all day, every day in front of your computer, you get home at five o'clock, you walk in the door and the wife says, I've got mum and dad or so-and-so coming over for dinner tonight. If you've been in the office all day, you just go, no, that is not what I needed. I wanted to sit on the couch and stare at the TV or go through my phone. When you're on the, out in the field working all day, you walk in and the wife says, we've got people coming over for dinner. You are up and about. You're ready to socialise. You feel good. You're fit. Um, it's amazing the difference to me from getting off the tools to to how I used to. Um, yeah, it's like socialise will be up and about, ready for interaction, um, and I think it's that's that's what I miss. Yeah, a lot of good energy. The um, mowing boys when you interview them and stuff, they're com- unbelievably fit, healthy. I, I met I met a guy last week lost sixty seven kilos, I think, in three years doing it. Yeah. It's, and it's just amazing. So um, it's amazing. So many benefits to the business, and I recommend if you are watching this in the Geelong area and you want to do something, don't be one of those blokes who did 10 years ago, look at it and then wait 10 years and say, should have done it sooner. And buy with Ben. Ben's a really good, well-experienced franchisor and Ben's been kind enough to be the first one to do our Jim's Mowing franchise Ooh. profile. So we'd be glad to doing that. Uh, feel free to edit as much of it out as you want, Joel. 
Um, <laughs> but no, uh, appreciate you reaching out to me, and um, we do we we franchise all of us. Um, value what the uh, uh, that you and your team do, Joel. It's it's great for us to have that behind us. And if you're listening to this um, and you do go ahead, I'm sure uh, if you do all the right things and have a good crack at it, you'll um, you won't regret it. And uh, yeah, just always seek help and ring your franchise or every day if you need to. That's 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 what they're there for, and they can help you. There we go. Well, thank you very much, Ben. And if you want to inquire, one two one five four six or jimsmine dot com. you and one of our franchisors like Ben will be in touch ASAP and do a trial day and. Hopefully we can talk to you and maybe in a couple of years' time to see how you come. But thank you very much for your time, Ben. We appreciate it today. Great job, Joel. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the episode of the More Than Just Mowing podcast by Jim's Mowing. If you do need help with your local gardening expert, please give us a call at 131 546 for Australia, 0800 454 654 for New Zealand, or head to jimsmowing.com.au or jimsmowing.co.nz. If you liked what you heard, please make sure you leave us a review as well. Wherever you consume your podcast, we appreciate your support. And until next episode, We hope you have a great week.